Danke. All right. Good evening, everybody. I'm Martin Krause. I'm a board member here at the Explorers Club. And it's with great pleasure that I'm introducing David Guggenheim here. We've met before on Cuba. It's a fascinating place. But let me start off with him. So he is a marine scientist, a conservation policy specialist, ocean explorer, submersible pilot, author, and educator. He founded an NGO called Ocean Doctors, which is based in DC and dedicated to ocean conservation. But at the same time, he's an adjunct professor at John Hopkins. And I think the reason why we're here is he's been working for the last 20 years in Cuba. Apparently, he hasn't been back for a while, and I think he's looking very much forward to going back again. Um, has been working for 20 years in Cuba, leading collaborative research and conservation efforts, focusing on coral reef ecosystems. And you're going to hear it's amazing there. And I can just, I've been there. We were speaking before I went to Cuba a couple of years ago. It's just amazing. And so tonight, where I, he will be presenting the highlights from his just released book. I think you've seen it outside. If you haven't gotten a copy yet, he'll be signing it after the event here. So it's called The Remarkable Reefs of Cuba, Hopeful Stories from the Ocean Doctor. It details his work and sheds light on why Cuba's reefs thrive in the world of rapidly dying corals. And when you go, I think, 100 miles further north, they are dead. And I think you started your career there, and when you go a bit down, it's, it's really incredible. So, but he has done other accomplishments. I think you became a fellow in 2008, and I think part of the reason why I became it, he was on the first, he piloted the first manned submersible in canyons in the Alaskan Bering Sea, slightly colder than Cuba. And so uh, he's been regularly appearing on TV and radio been 16 minutes, I think, on Cuba. That has been an important one, but on others as well. He holds a PhD in environmental science and public policy from George Mason University, a master in aquatic and population biology from University of California, Santa Barbara, and a master's in regional science and bachelor in environmental studies from the University of Pennsylvania. But we're here at the Explorers Club, so I think I introduce David. Give me just one second. I don't know who has, who of you has never been here? Who's, for whose is the first time? Please raise your hand. We have quite a couple. Unfortunately, our barman is not here tonight. Otherwise, I would have said the next question would have been, who is a member? Who is a member here of the club? I would have normally said, hey, listen, why do you look who's a member? They might be able to bring you down to the bar. But unfortunately, that is not working. But... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, so the Explorers Club was founded in 1904 by polar explorers. There are lots of ocean exploration that has been going on. Uh, you got, for example, here's Roy Andrew Chapman's flag, the Indiana Jones. When you have the time, have a look here. There's an Apollo 13 flag that is fascinating. That's um, sled that Perry and Hansen brought to the North Pole. So there's so much going on here, it's really interesting. And like I said, maybe you can talk to the members if you're interested in the club, want to get more about it. We have quite a bit going on at the club again over the next days. I think we're starting on 2nd of November. We have something called the EC50, the Explorers Club 50, which are new upcoming explorers. And uh, there's something called the Wave Makers. That's going to be on 2nd. On the 7th, we have Exploring Through Music. And then on November 12th, kind of uh, in two weeks, on Saturday, we have Sea Stories. Goes a bit along the theme here as well. So with this introduction of the Explorers Club, I want to give the mic over to David. I'm really looking forward to hear about Cuba and the coral reef there. Thanks. <laughs> it's so nice to be back. It's been over three years because of you know what. And um, it's so nice to see so many familiar faces and meet the acquaintance of so many new faces as well. And uh, I really appreciate you coming out uh, tonight. It's Halloween, we could all be getting candy and going crazy. 
<laughs> Some of you are, I think. Um, I um, am so happy to have released this book. My students showed up for the big uh, release um, on October 1st. My first book, it was a difficult birth, but I'm, um, I'm very, very uh, happy about it. It's 20 years of a, uh, of a white guy from Philadelphia trying to you know, stumble his way through Cuba and um, found some pretty amazing things along the way. And let's start with some of those amazing things. I got a little teary. I missed that place. We're neighbors, Cuba and the US, but sometimes neighbors don't get along so well. Um, but we share a neighborhood. Why should we work in Cuba? Well, if you look, um, we are connected by underwater currents. We're part of the same underwater ecosystem. Um, there are great corridors underwater. Uh, we see the Florida Straits not as separating us, but as uniting us. And Cuban fish grow up to be American fish. <laughs> they have, there are studies that show that the larvae will survive the journey to the United States. Sea turtles don't know the difference between Cuba and the U.S. They nest on U.S. Uh, beaches and forage in Cuban waters and vice versa. So we really have to find a way to work together. And for many years, uh, actually 20, more than 20 years, um, I've been working with the University of Havana with other, a variety of NGO partners. And this is the Center for Marine Research in all of its glory. Um, and really some incredible people. Getting to Cuba in the early days, the Bush administration was tricky. You could take these charter flights, but they were awful. So very often I'd fly through Canada, the Bahamas, uh, Cayman Islands, and most often Mexico through Cancun. And I remember one night uh, every flight was delayed. I'm sitting in Cancun Airport, and I will quote from the book. I did a rough calculation despite my foggy head. I realized that I could have flown from D.C. to Heathrow, grabbed the Heathrow Express into London, made my way to Buck Buckingham Palace, had tea with the Queen, bless her heart, and returned to D.C., in less time than to travel to a country just 90 miles away from the US. And to be conservative, I calculated that my tea with the queen would be brief and not include scones or biscuits. <laughs> this is the Center for Marine Research's good boat. Uh, the other boat 
has been at the bottom of a river for 20 years. <laughs> this is made of concrete. Uh, it's a ferro-cement boat, and it floats, but it's not seaworthy. Um, we needed a good boat because we were about to launch a decade of expeditions. So I had to go to the Comandante de la Revolución, Guillermo García Frías, the Comandante of the Revolution. He fought with Fidel. And my interpreter was a low talker, if you uh, see Seinfeld. Um, <laughs> by the way, the puffy shirt is in the Smithsonian, if you don't know that. Um, but I digress. So I had to speak in Spanish when my Spanish was terrible. And I spoke to him, and he held me. He held up his hand, and he said, and I was about to die, he goes, ¿Cómo es posible un gringo está aquí en mi oficina hablando inglés perfectamente? How is it possible some gringo from Washington is in my office speaking great Spanish? Anyway, we became very unlikely allies, and we got the boat. And we spent 10 years doing these expeditions and the first ecosystem maps of the Gulf of Mexico of Cuba, the northwestern coast. One of the themes that we learned is there's been so little research. And in the process, we helped train the next generation of marine biologists. I mean, getting on the water is kind of important if you're going to be a marine biologist. The woman in the foreground, Patricia Gonzalez, um, she eventually uh, headed the center. She just stepped down recently. Why am I taking you to Alaska? Uh, so I'm taking you to Alaska to make a point. Oh, and by the way, you may see me with a uh, Washington Nationals hat on. Um, that's my adopted team. I'm from Philadelphia, so just for the record, <laughs> If, uh, if anybody's cheating and looking at their iPhone and there's a score change, feel free to shout it out, but only if the Phillies are up. Okay. <laughs> so we went there to, uh, this was a Greenpeace expedition. Um, we didn't chain ourselves to anything. This was research. We explored the two largest underwater canyons in the world. Jemchug is twice as long as the Grand Canyon and nearly one and a half size uh, times deeper. Um, and by luck of the draw, I became the first submersible pilot to go into those canyons, literally drawing a number out of a coffee cup in the galley. Um, and that got me into the Explorers Club, so thanks, guys. <laughs> the last thing you'd expect to find at 2,000 feet is coral. This is coral called Swiftia pacific. It's a soft coral, but definitely a cousin of the corals that we know in the, in the temperate regions, the tropical regions. Coral is the longest living animal on the planet. In fact, they have lived to be 4,000 years old, witness to the birth of the Bronze Age, the completion of Stonehenge, the reign of the pharaohs of Egypt, the birth of Christ, and the finale of Breaking Bad. <laughs> that is a long time to live, but at least they saw the final uh, finale. Um, and many kinds of corals down there, so colorful. And where you see coral, you see fish. This is true in the Bering Sea. This is um, bamboo coral with a beautiful halibut there hanging out. Um, and then the occasional octopus. Corals and fish go together. It's habitat. It's important. And here are the tropical cousins. This is in Cuba, brain coral, very, very healthy coral. So I kind of gave it away, part of it. But is coral an animal, mineral, or vegetable? It's a trick question. It is an animal. It is an animal. It's a colonial animal. But it also has, many of them in the tropics, has algae living inside, symbiosis. And it also creates a calcium carbonate scale. So you could say that's a mineral. So it's kind of all three. Um, why do we care? The, the value of corals is incredible. 
the Nature Conservancy did a great job with this graphic. $9.9 .9 trillion. It's worth 500 million people depend on coral reefs. Half of all the new medicines for cancer are coming from the oceans, including coral reefs, which use special chemicals to compete with one another, um, which are very selective. Biodiversity. It's estimated that corals cover less than 1% of the planet and yet are responsible for 25% of marine species. Um, it's incredible. It might be you know, anywhere from one to nine million. This is not a coral reef species, but this is an example of what we can find under the, under the ocean. This was from um, the, uh, I forget the name, of the Census of Marine Life. And that's the Bob Marley worm. Uh, you can see the dreads, and I just show this to you because it's cool and show you that, yes, we scientists do have a sense of humor. Um, coastal protection, absorbing 97% of wave energy, and of course, tourism and food production. So corals do a lot for us, but we don't have much coral on our planet. Here's our planet, and here's how much coral we have. It would basically fill the state of Texas. That ain't much, unless you're from Texas, because you think Texas is pretty big. But that's not a lot. And corals have also been described as the most threatened species, animal, on the planet, and you can tell, this is from the IUCN's red list, look at the slope of that curve for corals. It's, it's frightening. So, by the way, club member Galen Rosenwax took this photo. There's a number of us sea campers around here. Uh, the book is very heavy on sea camp, but I went there as a teenager at 15, to frolic in the Florida Keys and the incredibly beautiful reefs there. Um, and in those days, this is what you would see. This is elk horn coral, one of the most important reef building corals. And it just was endless. That's why I became a marine biologist. 10 years later, this is what it looked like, covered with algae and slime. 10 years later, 10 years later, and then nine years later, you can barely tell that there was a reef there. 90% roughly of the reefs in the Florida Keys are gone. It is really sad. They may be there as skeletons, there's still fish, um, but they're pretty much gone. It's depressing. And people like me dream of a time machine to go back in time. This is our icon now of a time machine, a DeLorean. This is not a DeLorean, <laughs> but it's a time machine and part of something that's, that's quite special because look at the Elkhorn coral in Cuba. It is unbelievably healthy and with fish. This is a protected area, no fishing allowed. And these are grunts. And this looks healthier than I remember from my teenage days. You can tell I'm a bit of an Elkhorn coral nut. Um, but it's so important to the ecosystem. You can see, just like those corals in Alaska, how important corals are as refuge for fish and protection. And by the way, that reef you saw, this is staghorn coral, that reef you saw goes on for 30 miles. It's a barrier reef along the southern coast of Cuba. And that is pillar coral, a pretty rare species, but thriving in, in Cuba. And we must not leave out our soft corals like we saw in Alaska. They are also doing very, very well and just 
take your breath away, and tearing up again. So if you compare, that's Jardines de la Reina, Gardens of the Queen. That's kind of a fair comparison, isn't it? It's, it's really a time machine and a living laboratory. And um, we can learn so much. We don't have ecosystems like that to learn from anymore. And um, you can find this online. Uh, by the way, I had the hair color first because I'm older than Anderson. <laughs> I let him know that they had trouble telling us apart underwater. <laughs> they did ask me not to kill him. They said, maybe it's best if he doesn't go below 60 feet and no sharks. So of course on the first dive, he's at 100 feet, surrounded by sharks, and he ran out of air. <laughs> he's a good diver though. Um, but um, 60 Minutes, you can find it on YouTube, came to us. I got the call from CBS because they knew, they wanted to do something on coral reefs, they knew that the public wouldn't understand the story unless they could see what a healthy coral reef looks like. And that's why they came to Cuba. And I feel very honored about that. This video uh, won't play. So let's go on to a little bit. I'm going to bring you down a little bit, but I promise to bring you back. I already started bringing you down with that other, that other slide. We all know climate change is a big part of this story. Um, you know, we've seen images of uh, bleaching of corals. What bleaching is, some, this coral is probably still alive, but on life support, because that algae that lives inside, once it gets uh, very hot, it's expelled. It, 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 um, for, for whatever reason, um, that weakens the coral significantly. So many warming events have occurred just recently, and who would ever imagine that one of the most well-managed reefs in the world, the Great Barrier Reef, would lose half of its corals? Um, if you haven't seen Chasing Coral, you have to see it. It's on Netflix. It's an incredibly moving piece looking at these back-to-back -back warming events in Australia and absolutely depressing. I promised somebody that there was a Star Trek slide. <laughs> Climate change does have an evil twin. Um, and this is the only chemistry slide. This will be on the test. But you mix water and carbon dioxide, you get carbonic acid. And that's what's happening. That same carbon dioxide that's going into the atmosphere is dissolving in seawater and you know how many things have a calcium carbonate shell, the shells you pick up at the beach, and unfortunately, corals. So this is another threat. Um, and some people think this is a greater threat to coral reefs. The other thing that we should be concerned about is the broad effects of this. The Great Cliffs of Dover, and we all have seen them. They're iconic and beautiful. They're made up of small plankton called coccolithophores, which have, you see those plates? Guess what they're made of? Calcium carbonate. So the reason I'm presenting this slide is because it shows that ocean acidification is affecting even the bottom of the food chain, the very base of the food chain at the planktonic level. That's scary. I describe corals as the princess and the pea. They're fussy and they hate everything we do and they feel everything that we do. They're damn hard to please. Um, and the thing is, we forget about the fact that there are local threats. We have these global threats that we just talked about, but you don't often hear about the local threats to coral reefs. Now in our country, um, we had issues with our rivers and streams and oceans, pollution, and Rachel Carson really brought a lot of this to light. She started a movement that didn't exist before. And then the Cuyahoga River 
caught on fire. Actually, it caught on fire many times in the 50s, but that photograph made headlines. It, was, it outraged people. Um, there was toxic pollution coming out of factories. And in comes Richard Milhouse Nixon, of all people, a Republican, bipartisanship, signs in some of the most important landmark legislation ever, including the Clean Water Act. He established the EPA. He established NOAA. Uh, really quite remarkable. Don't see that happening today. The Clean Water Act really succeeded. But after we cleaned up the rivers from those toxic pollutants, we started facing other issues that we really didn't plan for in the Clean Water Act. So here's, uh, this won't be on the test, but what is the number one irrigated crop in the United States? Who knows? Sugar? What was that? Corn? Turf grass. 40 million, maybe more, acres of land. We have inherited the British obsession with lawns. And we fertilize them like crazy, and we over-fertilize them. And you multiply that by all the lawns in the country, it's a huge, huge number. And I love this, this is from New Jersey. If you fertilize too much, you might as well fertilize the stream. It's really trying to raise awareness because it's not those point sources anymore. It's not those pipes. It's non-point source pollution. And it's coming from the lawns of suburbia. In fact, I was in Ohio, and these kids asked me, um, it was during the Gulf spill, and they said, how can we help the Gulf? I said, kill your lawn. <laughs> well or stop fertilizing too much because that stream, I took that in Ohio, will eventually go to the Gulf of Mexico. By the way, in Cuba, not so many lawns, except in front of the embassies. Of course, the other thing is big ag. Big agriculture and the um, amount of fertilizers used and the amount of fertilizers that end up in the water. And what happens is, does the same thing that it does on houseplants. It stimulates, it provides nutrients for the growth of algae, plants. That algae dies, um, and then bacteria go to work on it, rob the water of its oxygen, and that's a very serious problem for the Gulf of Mexico. All of that in pink, and they've cut off a little bit of Manitoba and Saskatchewan, all of that, 44% of the US drains into the Gulf of Mexico. And because of what I was talking about, of that nutrient effect, there is a dead zone in, at the mouth of the Mississippi, the size of the state of New Jersey. It is enormous. This is just the surface uh, effluent, but it just shows you how nasty that water is. That's not a normal um, division of of river water and uh, ocean water at all. Which takes us to the Everglades. So I'm still talking about non-point source pollution and water in general. This inseparable, inextricable link between land and water. I was co-chair of the Everglades Coalition. I am obsessed with the Everglades. They're so beautiful. This is what they used to look like. and. This was the attitude back in the 1800s. Um, the most hideous region to live in. Uh, perfect paradise for Indians, alligators, serpents, frogs, and every, every other kind of loathsome reptile. So what better thing to do? Fill it in. Get rid of that awful wasteland. And today, it's one of the most incredible human-managed systems in the world but it's got some serious flaws. And one of them is changing completely the flow of water. For example, Lake Okeechobee is dammed up and it's right next to sugar agriculture. And once again, nutrients come in, stimulate the growth of algae, 
and this stuff is nasty, and when it dies, and if the lake gets too high, they have to do releases into the Atlantic and down the Caloosahatchee River, right by Fort Myers. And if you think that color I chose is an exaggeration, that's Fort Myers. Uh, well, not today, but um, that is what that looks like. That is, that is seriously detrimental to ocean life. This is my testimony to Congress back in 2000, uh, trying to get the Everglades bill passed. And one of the things I said is basically it's very ironic because we've paved over so much in our cities, it's ironic that we've managed to make fresh water itself a pollutant. The Everglades was slowly moving water. We've by paving um, many cities and everything, that water now reaches our bays and estuaries much, much faster. This is Rookery Bay. This is a salinity graph. Can you see how fast that salinity drops to almost fresh water? Estuaries, which are the nursery grounds for our oceans, depend on a very delicate balance of fresh and salt water. So the point is that, um, we're fundamentally changing uh, the way our, our oceans look and our estuaries look. This is Naples Bay, some of the most expensive real estate in the world. That bay is dead. I've been in it. Um, it's, over, it's all this fresh water being dumped into it. It used to be an estuary. There's nothing living in there virtually. So the Everglades plan is to restore as best it can be restored that natural ecosystem so that the right quality of water reaches the right place at the right time. It'll never be what it was, but it's so important to remember that if you're going to keep your oceans healthy, you have to care about what happens on the land. That includes, in this case, you saw this slide before, the Florida Keys, part of Everglades restoration is putting in a 100-mile sewer system. It's one of the most expensive elements because there were septic tanks in limestone, porous limestone, and all of those nutrients made their way out uh, and stimulated the growth of algae. And that's what I want to talk about now is algae. Um, you, you thought you were here for a lecture on Cuba. I'm going to drag you through algae here. There was a pandemic of perhaps unprecedented uh, proportions. This spiny sea urchin died off almost completely within a few months in the Caribbean. And the problem is this critter loves to eat algae. It's um, really important for coral reefs, and we lost it. And at the same time, we're putting more and more nutrients in the water that stimulates the growth of algae. Now, this is a report on the health of coral reefs. Uh, depressing. We've lost half of the coral reefs in the Caribbean since 1970. But the real question is, why isn't there a coral reef on the cover, and why is there a parrotfish in a net here? And the answer is that parrotfish are really important to coral reefs. They actually crunch coral reefs. They eat um, algae. And they'll eat the unhealthy parts of reefs and keep them clean. And I quote, 90% oh, wait a second. Let me, I've got some video here. Hang on. OK. See, they're, they're crunching. I forgot to turn this volume down. So they really, they're hard to film. They go too fast. But OK, now this is important. Wait for it. Wait for it. There we go. See that? OK. If you missed it, here's the replay. OK. I'm a biologist. I can talk about such things. So 90% of a parrotfish's day is spent 
noisily eating coral reefs. It is common to see parrotfish swimming about, nonchalantly emitting a contrail of white sand from their anus, the end product of coral as it is pulverized, passing through their digestive system. That sandy fish poop makes up a substantial part of the sandy halo surrounding reefs and coral heads. So fair warning, if you find yourself scuba diving and kneeling in the sand near a reef, it may well have traveled through the gut and anus of a parrotfish to get there. Feel honored. Um, they're very important, and unfortunately, they're being eaten uh, around the Caribbean, especially in Jamaica. These are the kids of a friend of mine in the US Virgin Islands, a fisherman that's a parrotfish there. That's what you see in the market. And the thing is about fish, this is back to the Bering Sea, but the, just by way of example, we're taking so many fish from the sea. This is a Russian trawler um, factory ship. And the thing is, we largely are still managing fish the way we manage corn or other crops. Maximum sustainable yield. And fish have jobs to do, like the parrotfish. They're part of the ecosystem. They're not crops that grow within it. This beautiful red hind grouper, he's got work to do. Like, let him do his work. This is uh, kind of the opposite of a Russian trawler. This uh, typical Cuban fishing boat, hook and line, um, not nearly as destructive. So I'm going to switch gears here. Um, in 1991, it was the end of the Soviet Union. And with it, all of the subsidies, all of the fuel uh, that went to Cuba. And Cuba went into its so-called special period, one of the most uh, grandiose euphemisms I've ever heard. It was a terrible time. People lost 20 pounds at least. Uh, it was a very, very hard time. There was no oil. Uh, there was no fuel for transportation. They built these things called cameos, which could hold 150 people. My friend from the Cuban Academy of Sciences encouraged me to get in there. He said, David, Get aboard, you get a free sauna with a ride, you know. Nitsa um, Veyapo, she's like the Julia Child of Cuba. She was on TV for many, many years and during that period was teaching people how to make ropa vieja, uh, which is basically shredded beef out of banana peels. My good friend, um, one of the scientists at the Center for Marine Research, she told me she would cut the uh, white part, uh, the pith, I guess, of a grapefruit out of the grapefruit, bread it and fry it, and she said it tasted just like steak. And I could still see that twinkle in her eyes. This is how bad it was during that period. If you killed a cow, actually I think this law is still in the books, you'd go to jail for 15 to 25 years. And Cuba was forced to basically abandon all those Russian tractors and that whole path toward mechanized farming and go back to essentially the 1800s. Um, very primitive but organic farming. And to this day, Cuba is still basically, maybe you know, I, I, the figure is unclear, but it's maybe 70%. And we always thought its rivers probably had a much lower nutrient load. And we didn't really know what that number was until recently. Paul Bierman at the uh, University of Vermont did studies. And he found that um, the Cuban rivers have less than a quarter of the nutrient load of, than the Mississippi. It's much lower. But there's no data to know how that's changed over time, unfortunately. And that's, again, so typical, no, no research. And up sprung these organico, orga, this is a hard one for me, organiponicos, these organic gardens, urban farming. I didn't Photoshop that color. That is damn good lettuce. And it's organic. And it's amazing. Now, Cuba isn't completely you know, 
how should I say, angelic about its agriculture. This is, goes back to 1966. They've always been concerned about um, food. It was always a big thing. So Fidel gave a speech and he said, we also plan to develop all of our water resources with the goal of not permitting one drop of water to reach the sea. If you're a marine biologist, <laughs> you know, again, um, worst thing you can do, and it actually did have a serious effect on uh, populations of shrimp uh, in the estuaries. But Cuba has really been good, and if you think about it, what coral reefs like, this could have helped coral reefs, uh, ironically, and certainly organic agriculture helps coral reefs because you don't see coral reefs smothered with algae the way they are, uh, th the way that you saw in the Florida Keys. And you've got beautiful, healthy uh, staghorn coral, a very close relative of elkhorn coral, uh, in Cuba. Okay, yes. That's the icon of Jacques Cousteau. Uh, let's go to 1985. A fiery dawn finds a complex new mission beginning. As the rediscovery of the world lures Calypso to Cuba, the Caribbean's most intriguing island. I wish I could show the whole thing to you. It's fascinating. But that's Cousteau when he came up after his, one of his dives. And already in 1985, he said, the reef more rich than any I've seen in years, because already the Caribbean was collapsing. Um, he got to know Fidel. That's aboard Calypso. And they became close friends. And in fact, a few years later at the Earth Summit, Cousteau was walking by when all the world leaders were having their photo op, and he pulled Cousteau in. He goes, you need to be in this shot. So they had the world leader of the oceans along with everybody else. Um, that's Bobby Kennedy, and he was with us. I led the, the club's first uh, flagged expedition to Cuba. And he met with Fidel and received a letter back confirming what we pretty much knew, but in writing that, that Jacques Cousteau had a huge impact on Fidel, and in turn on the laws in Cuba, including their most important law, it is the basic right of society and its citizens, the right to a sound environment. Um, and they established protected areas, 25% of their waters in protected areas. I remember when I, st back in 2000, we had literally one one hundredth of 1%. So they, they were way ahead of us. Here's the Constitution. This is just in 2019. Climate change is in the Constitution, one of 10 countries to have dealing with climate change in their Constitution. Can you imagine the debate here uh, in getting that into our Constitution? That would be an interesting dialogue. Um, I don't want to depress you too much, but back to the keys, human sewage um, is linked to some of these diseases. So the transfer of human waste Diseases are a big problem in the Caribbean, not just because of human waste, but in Cuba, they've really been spared from much of that uh, problem. All right, now I'm gonna bring you back up. Um, we're really grateful to Teddy Roosevelt, to the Antiquities Act, to our national park system. We've preserved so many beautiful places on land. In the water, we're still lagging behind. Um, but these protected areas are our insurance policy, and they protect everything within that ecosystem, a whole integrated ecosystem, like these frigate birds that depend on the fish within an ecosystem. So these numbers change quite a bit about, you know, it's sort of a two to one ratio, land versus water. 
Also, the problem is, what is a protected area? That definition changes. You can fish in a national marine sanctuary. There's a lot you can do. You just can't drill for oil. So getting our terminology straight is important. And the areas I've been showing you from Gardens of the Queen, from other parts of southern Cuba, and from the Isle of Youth are no-take marine reserves, no fishing. You don't take anything out of there. You just leave bubbles behind. We're finally catching up. This is Papahana Makuakea National Marine uh, Monument in Hawaii. George Bush established it, and Obama doubled the size of it. Republican, Democrat, bipartisan. Do you, do you, do you know that word? OK, because I see blank stares. Um, Again, Cuba's network of protected areas is important. Unfortunately, some of them you see illegal fishing in. Even though you've got the Ministry of the Environment and the Ministry of Food sort of at, at odds with one another. Um, we know about lionfish. We serve it at the, at the uh, annual dinner. Um, it's an invasive species, not its fault, it's gorgeous. But in Cuba, and they get big, by the way. Um, in Cuba, you know, uh, by the way, here's, here's a graphic of how these have spread. There are many theories of how they even got into the waters near Miami in the first place. But you can see this is 2009, all around Cuba, all, as far up as New England. Um, but in Cuba, You've got huge protected areas and lots of predators. And I love the fact that there are derbies to go out and kill them, but um, in the end, I think Mother Nature has to take care of herself. And by establishing these protected areas with large predators, maybe we can train sharks to, you know, to eat them, to hunt them. And this isn't ideal to go out and feed them a, a lionfish lollipop. Um, there's a grouper, a black grouper, and there he goes, okay. So that's a thought. Again, an advantage of a no-take marine protected area is you've got these large predators that are there, and maybe um, Mother Nature can take care of herself, and in fact, the dive masters we were with, the Cuban scientists, have seen on occasion sharks going after these lionfish on their own without being served a lollipop. The other thing that gives me hope, another thing that gives me hope, is the fact that our attitudes have changed a lot about the environment. It used to be free. We could dump whatever we wanted or take whatever we wanted. There was nothing on that side of the ledger. You didn't have to pay for that, and that's changing. And we're putting an economic value on the environment, finally. And this is a study by World Resources Institute in Belize, looking at coral reefs and mangroves. And look at this. The value of shoreline protection of corals and mangroves is greater than tourism and fisheries combined. And anyone that went through Hurricane Ian or Irma, you know, would, <laughs> would be happy for that. You understand why. Here again is that what we talked about earlier, that coral reefs can absorb 97% of wave energy. They're so important. And if you do the math, if you do the economics, it is 15 times more cost efficient to restore coral reefs than it is to build seawalls and other gray infrastructure to protect against um, storms and sea level rise. And believe it or not, a socialist country, the use of environmental economics is written into Cuban law. And unfortunately, it's still an unfulfilled mandate, and that's where we come in. We've been working with Cuban colleagues on a series of workshops to really develop environmental economics um, as, a, as a part of, of their uh, policy to protect the waters. You may know about a study done in Palau. This is Cuba. 
that shark would wor be worth what on a dinner plate? A few hundred dollars, maybe a thousand. Uh, in Palau, they'd done a study, that shark would be worth $2 million because of tourism. This guy, who was on one of my trips, paid almost $10,000 to go with me on this trip. That's a lot of money. So tourism, tourism is part of this economic equation. But tourism can be scary, too. It's got to be the right kind of tourism. We did this report because we were scared. Cuba opened up to, under Obama, and the big, they called it the Tsunami of Norte Americano, the North American Tsunami. It came, and it was big. And um, I really had trouble explaining this, what spring break is uh, to the Cubans. There's no direct translation, but the idea of a Cancun-style mass tourism model, we have decimated the Caribbean with mass tourism. And trying to avoid that model is really important for Cuba. They have a chance to really do it right. Now, the problem is, if you have protected areas that you're setting up, you need to enforce them. And I imagined that this would be something like the enforcement vessel at the Gardens of the Queen. And the crew came down, because I kept asking about it. They said, David, David, está aquí. You know, it's here, it's here, the enforcement vessel. And I came up with my camera, and there it is. <laughs> you can walk faster than that. Now, that covering a 1,000 square kilometers, I don't think so. But you want to see who's really in charge in terms of, um, of keeping an eye and doing the enforcement? It's Elsa, the housekeeper on a liveaboard boat. Tourism brings an incredible amount of money to people like her. If she sees an unfamiliar boat, she's going to report it. And that's true of the whole crew and everybody. They know every boat that belongs in that area. So if you can invest that spirit into people that the environment is valuable and worth protecting and you get something out of it, that's something strong. I was talking to some people about the Isle of Youth earlier. That's where we're focusing a lot of our work. It's actually the seventh largest island in the West Indies, and nobody's ever heard of it. Uh, it's gorgeous. It is beautiful. The southern half is practically untouched, except for a little community called Cocodrilo, which it means crocodile, where horses run free, and this little boy's learning to drive. Um, and just, just stunning. And they have a huge protected area, just like Gardens of the Queen. That's where I took this shot, and beautiful corals. And again, trying to instill this sense of protecting that environment. And the thing is, Cuba has a chance to go a completely different direction than mass tourism. To keep things small. When I go to Cuba, I stay in a casa particular, a private home. It's great. They spoil you. They get the best food. Oh my God, the mangoes go in June. Um, and it's an authentic experience. And people will pay a premium for an authentic experience to really get to know the people. So this is the recommendation from our report. And Cuba still has an opportunity to do that. And so they established their first Casa Particular, their first bed and breakfast, and it's a dive center, um, which means there are really old regulators hanging over your head when you're sleeping. And I was the first American to stay there, and my only um, suggestion was to put some screens on the windows to keep the uh, mosquitoes out at night. But we are working with the um, uh, Department of Tourism at the uh, University of Havana on this. So um, I don't have time to talk about this now, <laughs> but OK, we've had parrotfish poop. Uh, somebody asked me later about whale poop, OK? Just, just remember that. But you know, this is exciting, because if we can take care of these local threats 
this land water, this overfishing of these uh, parrotfish and other fish that these reefs depend on, you can see with your own eyes how healthy those reefs are. They're sitting in the same hot water as our reefs. I've been 30 feet down and the water temperature was 87 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that's hot. So addressing, um, sorry, addressing local threats can really give corals um, a leg up, more time to survive those global threats. Um, if you kill your lawn, uh, this is the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods program. You know, it ain't so bad. Look, at the, look how beautiful that is, and you don't even have to water it. It wants to be there. It's native vegetation. Um, if we want to build resilience and buy time, there's a lot of thought going into this. Of course, what I just showed you in Cuba is doing things locally, but the prognosis is pretty bad. Um, 70 to 90 percent of corals may be lost under some of the projections uh, by the end of this century. And that's assuming we do some stabilization of greenhouse gases. And the idea is now is to do a form of triage. We know we're not going to be able to save everything, so let's find the healthiest reefs around the world that can endure this and seed later, once we control climate, seed areas again and repopulate those areas. And so a major study came out a few years ago in 2018. These are 50 areas they identified, ignore the colors, around the world where the reefs have the best chance of surviving, the ones we'd want to preserve. And let's just focus on the Caribbean. And if you look at this, Cuba, 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 Cuba. Five of the 50 in the world, 10%, are in Cuba. And that's incentive for us to really help Cuba protect its reefs and really understand the secrets of why they're so important. I should mention there's a lot of other work going on, really good work. Um, selective breeding. If you saw recent 60 Minutes, also with Anderson Cooper, they, they showed a lot of this going on using CRISPR to actually genetically modify corals. GMOs are a bad word, but these are desperate moments for corals. So trying to make them more heat tolerant. Um, a friend of mine in the Keys is uh, regrowing, um, this is staghorn coral. This has mixed results. If you replant them, you're replanting them in the same hot water where they died before. So if you're going to use this method, it has to be done carefully and uh, quite selectively in terms of where you, you put these corals. But it's a great idea, and there's success being shown in the keys, and more power to them to do that. Just a quick word that, I don't want to puff my chest out too much here, but um, marine science is recognized as one of the best areas of collaboration between the US and Cuba. And during those years when there were no diplomatic relations, it was the NGOs um, that really succeeded where the diplomats failed. Um, a shout out to Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who's in the book. Um, he. Um, that's a nice portrait. Let's, let's look at that for a minute. <laughs> he, um, co he founded the Senate Oceans Caucus, and his co-chair is Lisa Murkowski from Alaska. So you've got the biggest state and the smallest state, Republicans and Democrats, and once again, bipartisan work. He's also a Cubophile, and that is Fabian Pina, and he is standing, this is before the normalization of relations, in the Benjamin Franklin dining room of the State Department. That's history right there, and that's thanks to Senator Whitehouse. The idea that we're really working hard to, um, normal, or to, to collaborate and create this special bond. 
once relations were normalized, this is on 16th Street in DC, raising the Cuban flag for the first time in more than 50 years, reopening of the embassy, the famous Obama visit to Cuba, he shout out to the oceans, to the beautiful waters of this region that we share, and an announcement that we would cooperate on marine science. And the two first memoranda of understanding between Cuba and the United States re related to the environment were on ocean. So the last thing I'll say, I'm on a journey to all 50 states talking to kids about the oceans. From Alaska to the Virgin Islands, this is Georgia. I'm about halfway, it's a big country. And our friends in Cuba, they get it just like the American kids. The environment is precious to them. And I call my students the new ocean doctors. I think this new generation is ready for their turn at the helm. And that gives me hope. Thank you very much. I shall turn it back over to our esteemed moderator. And Thanks very much, David. I think that was really incredible. And I think, well, like you said, it's Cuba who was officially there, but I think you brought us through so much to show how climate change, how politics need to be together, work together on this. And I think like the last slide, I think Cuba is some hope in terms of environment, in terms of coral reefs. So. But we wanted to open up the floor now for questions. I think we have quite a bit of people on the internet as well. So I think we have people watching from Spain, Portugal, Brazil, Hawaii, and all across the country. So let's give them a shout out as well. And then maybe let's start here. Bonnie, you want to start? Sure, hi. Thank you, David. It was wonderful to see you again. Thank you, Bonnie. And a wonderful, and wonderful talk. responsible for uh, largely responsible for this. So thank you for making this happen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I have two questions. Um, the first is, um, I know there have been a number of efforts to restore coral in sunken, sunken ships. And have any of those been successful? Uh, and the second question is, I'm absolutely dying to find out about whale poop. <laughs> I don't know much about the sunken ships. Um, uh, the, you know, what I've read is, you know, some success, some not success. It also opens up a whole nother issue of artificial reefs, so we could spend a whole nother night uh, debating whether sinking ships and throwing subway cars into the ocean is actually doing any good, which New Jersey or New York did, right, uh, back a, a while ago. So I'm sorry, I don't have a lot of information about that. Whale poop. Um, there's a guy named Ralph Shami, who is at the uh, 25 years at the International Monetary Fund. So very unlikely that he and I became, you know, besties, but it happened. And there, it had happened because I, uh, through whales, I was chair of the Great Whale Conservancy. He came on, had a, like, incredible experience with blue whales in Baja. He went back, got on his iPad all night calculating the carbon that a whale is responsible for. And in its body, there's obviously a lot of carbon, but the magic is the poop. This is poop night, everybody. Um, because that fertilizer, it's still nitrogen, right? It's the same stuff that we've been talking about, but if you poop in the open ocean where there are no nutrients, the open ocean's been called a desert. You know, there's not a lot of life out there because there isn't a lot of plankton to create the base of the food chain. But if you've got thousands of whales of pooping, then you've got, then you've got something. And so he did the calculations. Um, and a single whale could be worth $3 million over its lifetime. That's a lot, of, a lot of money for a whale. 
And then if you multiply that, if you look back at how many blue whales there used to be, hundreds of thousands, then you're really in a huge number. And part of this is because the cost of carbon right now is on a logistic curve. Price of carbon is really going up. So I'm very excited to be working with Ralph right now. He's doing projects, for example, in Gabon, looking at elephants. Elephants clear about 10% of the forest. Sorry? Forest elephants? Ah, forest elephants. Ah, thank you. Yes, forest elephants. Oh, that's cool. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Bonnie knows her stuff. Um, so these guys get into the forest, they knock trees down, that opens up the canopy for new growth. Dead trees are great for carbon. They hold their carbon for hundreds of years. So this, these elephants really have a positive contribution to carbon sequestration as well. So not to mention they're carrying around a lot of carbon in, in their bodies. So the whole idea is a nature-based economy. We're overlooking all of these things. We're working with Ralph, and this, this, the genesis of this was my class. Four students in my class at Johns Hopkins, I can't take credit for this. They did it after they heard Ralph speak. The idea is to use his methodology in Florida, and I want to explain this just a little bit further. You know, carbon offset projects are a dime a dozen these days. You know, you get on your plane, you know, you know you're going to grow some trees somewhere, great. In that model, carbon is a cost. In Ralph's model, carbon is an investment with a possible return. And that's because he's using these economic models from the IMF, which I don't have time to go into, but the idea is the economics are the centerpiece, not the afterthought. So we're working with Ralph and my uh, students from Johns Hopkins, who've stayed on as ocean doctor interns, uh, to, uh, and we've already done work in Rookery Bay near uh, Naples, to look at the feasibility of private investment on public lands and that doesn't mean that private individuals would own any land, but they're buying the services of that ecosystem. They're just like they would be buying the services of the elephants. They're buying the services of mangroves and sea grasses. We're looking at doing fish. The value of those things to storm control, which I know they're thinking about in Southwest Florida right now, flood control, coastline protection, and all of that and um, our little pilot study showed, yeah, it works. The superintendent of Rookery Bay said, it's my dream to have restoration pay for itself. So if we go back to Everglades restoration, the largest restoration ever, uh, in terms of the most expensive one, imagine if we could pay for that through carbon uh, offset projects. So I'm very excited. We've talked with the state, the chief biologist. They're very intrigued. Then it came along Hurricane Ian. Um, but hopefully, um, this is something that will move forward. I think it's very exciting um, and something very different. And uh, let's just hope there aren't any more terrible storms down there. But that's whale poop to, <laughs> you know, that's, that's how we, we get there. Th David, thank you so much for uh, sure. being here. Very enlightening what you shared about Cuba. However, it was all before the pandemic. And the Russians at that point were really building tourism at an astronomical rate there. So fast forward to now, okay, with um, the relationship of Cuba with Russia right now and what's going on in the world. What is your opinion about going forward, about being able to save these beautiful reefs and the effect of uh, Russian tourism? Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of tourism, ironically, back during the Soviet Union, was uh, built for Russian tourists. Veradero looks kind of like Miami Beach. You know, it's, it's concentrated and contained. There aren't many places like that, fortunately, in Cuba. 
But I've seen, now I have to say, I haven't been back to Cuba in three years because of the pandemic. Cuba was closed. And, um, uh, you know, so I don't, I don't know firsthand, but when I left three years ago, I saw some of the plans that were very much leaning toward the mass tourism model, building of these huge hotels. They've built a lot of them in, already in Havana and that don't match, you know, we can also talk about historical preservation as well as, as um, biological, uh, uh, environmental preservation. You know, they just don't fit uh, their glass and, and all of, you know, the sort of ugly uh, hotels that you would find, want to find somewhere else, not in old Havana with its, its um, world heritage um, status. Um, I don't know much now about how the politics have evolved with Russia. Um, they've always been um, a presence, uh, but um, the real dominant tourism sector is coming from Canada and Europe. Um, uh, most, a lot of drivers are from the Czech Republic of, of all places, but um, it's, it's interesting to me how that works. But I don't know. I don't know if we need to be, how worried we need to be or not. Um, I hate what's going on. I think we all do uh, right now. And, um, but there is a relationship between Russia and Cuba. Cuba has um, maybe not overtly supported Russia, but they certainly haven't said anything negative about Russia. Yes. Hi. Oh, where's the mic? Uh, the question was about the reefs in Puerto Rico. Yes, Puerto Rico has many reefs, um, and some of them are, are quite healthy, the, but uh, in general, most of them have been degraded, uh, uh, unfortunately. I mean, there are hope, hopeful areas that, that have uh, a chance to, to really um, uh, survive and improve, but uh, sadly, the reefs there, uh, many of the reefs in the Virgin Islands, same situation. You know, there are pockets where you find very healthy reefs. I'm not saying that all the other reefs are gone, but you saw the statistic, 50% or so of the coral cover is gone from the Caribbean. And in Puerto Rico, a lot of it is, again, nutrient runoff. In the Virgin Islands, a lot of it is sedimentation because you've got, you've seen, if you've been to the Virgin Islands, you've see these homes going up the sides of these very steep uh, hills. And when it rains, all the sedimentation comes into the water and smothers the reef. I've seen this in Veracruz, Mexico. The rivers um, uh, are affected by sediment 100 miles away up the mountain where they're deforesting these areas, and then you've got fast moving water picking up sediment load and killing the reefs, unfortunately. So um, there's a lot of different reasons. I covered some of them tonight, but the idea is that the number's around 50%. And I'm not saying that all the reefs in Puerto Rico are dead. That's, that's you know, again, or the Virgin Islands or anywhere else. There's healthy reefs in Honduras, in Curacao, Bonaire, um, those are some of the healthy spots remaining as well. So Cuba isn't alone, but Cuba is probably the largest place in the Caribbean, um, certainly the largest island in the Caribbean where, um, and has the most number of coral reefs that are healthy, or area of coral reefs is what I want to say. Hi, yeah, I have a question. Uh, do you see any bleaching happening in the Cuba reefs? compared to Great Barrier, so it's the same level? Because it should be independent, it should be the temperature. Yeah, there is bleaching in Cuba. Uh, some, usually it's minor, uh, and it recovers very quickly. So in southern Cuba, I've seen even almost to 200 feet down, uh, it's more plate-like coral. Uh, and I've seen it um, bleach. 
it's like you go down and you see polka dots uh, around when you're, when you're diving. But you come back, uh, usually by November, it's got its algae back, it's, it's healthy again. So they might be right at the edge, you know, as temperatures moving up. In uh, Isle of Youth, you saw that beautiful, where that fish was eating the um, uh, jelly, uh, jellyfish, and that beautiful elkhorn coral, that has also bleached. Uh, uh, because it, you, it, you, I don't know if you could see in the video, it's very shallow water. You could almost stand up. No, I couldn't, but maybe somebody a little taller. Um, but it's, um, you know, so that water's really, really warm. And so s those elkhorn corals have bleached. But again, they've come back. Now, um, you know, some of them didn't make it. You know, some of them died. So, again, these are, this comes back to really trying to make these corals resilient um, and doing what we can. And there's only so much we can do if the water keeps warming. So really, uh, you know, this isn't a magic bullet. We have to deal with the global issues as well. We have, it, it, we're buying time. Uh, and, you know, that time is finite. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, how you. easy is it to find a diving or snorkeling um, outfitter to visit Cuba and see these waters? Well, we lead trips to Cuba, uh, but the, um, it's not that hard. Um, the, the challenge is, oh boy, I gotta get into the politics of US-Cuba relations. There's never a short answer to a simple question. The short answer is yes, they're down there. There are groups leading trips. We're, we lead trips. These days we're going to the Isle of Youth and the Bay of Pigs. Um, uh, which, and really interacting more on the land with the people as opposed to going on liveaboards uh, 50 miles off, offshore. These are, um, there are 12 categories of license that allow you to go to Cuba. Trump eliminated a number of them, including people-to-people -people travel. And on a people-to-people -people trip, tourism is illegal. We're not allowed to be tourists. On a people-to-people -people license, the idea is to have meaningful interaction with the Cuban people. And I remember back, oh God, the very beginning of the Obama, of, or, or when Obama started to announce changes, I submitted an application to OFAC, Office of Foreign Assets Control, with the Treasury Department, because it's an economic embargo, See, I'm telling you, it's a long answer. Um, I submitted an application to do people-to-people -people programs to take them out and dive. And I got a call. I, I really did a great job on this thing. And I got a call, and they said, David, you know, this is more people-to-animal than people-to-people. -people. <laughs> because it didn't include interaction with the Cuban people. So people-to-people, -people, you know, it's not that far from tourism, really. I mean, it's, but it's, it's tourism with a purpose, and I think a better form of tourism because you learn from the Cuban people. You're sitting down and breaking bread with them and learning firsthand. That's the best kind of experience, not to mention I, the part I was talking about before, the mangoes and getting spoiled and getting doted upon. I mean, and, but seeing how people live. So these exist. Um, but you will also get from some of the um, uh, some of the uh, providers or, or um, God, I'm getting coming up with the wrong. Sorry. No, the the um, concessions. I, I, you know, the people actually doing the service in Cuba, the Cubans, and one case, an Italian company that has the um, a monopoly on liveaboards and this sort of thing. They're engaging in some, um, some issues where they're um, luring people down um, and not really uh, letting people know what their responsibilities are as a uh, visitor under a people-to-people -people license. 
you have to keep records of everybody you've spoken to and keep them for five years and what you talked about and why it was a meaningful experience. Um, and then I have to submit for my license renewal an 80 page, one of mine was 80 pages recording all of that. So that's the difference. So you have to say a little bit sober each night <laughs> and write that and then you can, you know, go out and get the good rum and, and all of the rest. <sighs> Long answer, right? Um, but, but also be careful because some of them will lure you down on, say, a religious license or something else. There's uh, different categories. And it's just something to be mindful of. All right, do we have some more questions? We have one on the internet. Has commercial diving impacted the reefs in Cuba? Um, I would say it has been more positive than negative. Um, com wait, commercial diving or, or the tourist diving? They say commercial or, diving. Yeah, um, I, I am assuming that means um, the commercialization of scuba diving to bring, in, in air quotes, tourists to Cuba. And I think it's been a positive thing. I know Sylvia Earle and I have talked about this. I've heard her speak, and yes, divers run into coral. They scrape themselves. I had to pull one of the world's best photographers off the coral. He's lying on the coral trying to get the shot. And I told somebody tonight, we photographers make the worst divers because we're just focusing on our subject and not paying attention. Yes, there's some damage. I've rarely seen it. That was an exception to the rule. And on the whole, divers are an asset because they're bringing in money and they're creating, again, that incentive to protect these areas. And that's incredibly valuable. So. My view is uh, more divers are better, and they are, are actually, um, they do have carrying capacity numbers to let a, only a certain number of divers in, you know, per year in particular areas. So that's good, that's really good, and you need that. All right, one last question. Okay, let's go there. And then afterwards, yeah, I think we can do the book signing then. Yeah. That's why I put that slide up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that was a great talk. That was, uh, Thank that was you. really interesting. Um, so you, you, you touched upon uh, some of the diseases uh, that killed off a lot of the acroperids, you know, like 40 years ago, the diadema die off. Um, and we talked about, you know, the bleaching as well. Um, the thing is, you know, these, these, th these things are, are cyclic. These, these ecological phenomena are cyclic. And, and just recently, in the past five years, a lot of spots in the Caribbean uh, had another diadema die off, and yep. um, especially Florida, you know, has dealt with the with the uh, stony coral, exactly. uh, the, the tissue loss disease. Have you heard any a word from from your your, your Cuban collaborators about these these recent um, um, your str stressors? So, um, the diadema, the spiny sea urchin, um, died off in Cuba as well, but it's making a faster recovery there. That's, that's, that's a fast, slow recovery. It's not fast at all, but it's, it's doing better than uh, other areas. But I don't know how it's done. You're absolutely right. These things are cyclical. Um, I don't know how they're doing right now. Um, the stony coral tissue loss, this is a frightening disease that's spreading throughout the Caribbean. It's rapidly attacking corals, including Elkhorn corals. And it hasn't made it to Cuba, as far as I know. Now, I last checked in, let's see, last year. Uh, I was interviewing one of my colleagues for the book, and she said, no, uh, it's not here. Meanwhile, um, you know, the, 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 these areas are getting ravaged by this disease. So again, another disease coming, many cases we're now learning that we are the, the culprits. Um, I don't know if that's true with that disease, white pox certainly, um, but there, you know, I didn't want to go into all of these diseases, we'd be here all night, but there are quite a few and they're increasing in frequency and severity, unfortunately, and as you say, they're cyclical. 
and, um, and you know, making it a great challenge for us to manage. All right. I think we're done then. I think it's Halloween. <laughs> it was a bit scary in some corners, but I think <laughs> it was definitely worth being here. Yeah, I don't know if we can do trick-or-treat. Bonnie, do we have something downstairs? Uh-oh, we do. We do, so if somebody... Okay, so anyway, thanks very much, everybody, for coming. Thanks, David, for... <laughs> presenting.